Good evening, everyone. I want to tell you about my family. And I want to tell you about me. And I want to tell you about God. And we're going to see how it all falls out and what order it comes in. I got some notes, but I really want to see what God's got in store. But I was born in 1960, ironically, November 22nd, 1960. So I'll be 55 years old this Sunday. Happy birthday to me. I had no intentions of being this old. I was going to kill myself on the night before I turned 40 years old because that was old and I wasn't going to be old. I'm still not old. I came from a family, what people would call today blended, but in the 60s they called it broken. And it was broken in many ways. My mother and father who cared enough about each other for brief moments to conceive children now couldn't stand each other and they wanted to put as much dry land between them as possible. So my mother stayed in Florida, my father moved to California. My father being an alcoholic, and what do alcoholics do? They find an enabler, and he found the best one in the world. And she promised him everything, and he said okay. And so they got married and reached down to Florida and grabbed me and my brother because not because he wanted us, but because he hated my mother so much, he wanted to spite her. And it took me many years to ask him the questions. Actually, it was after he died before I could ask him the question, did you hate her so much? Why was it necessary for me and my brother to pay that price? But it was, and we did. And we moved to California, and there was this new family out there. And I had this stepmother, the enabler, and I had these new siblings. A stepsister who was four months older than me, so I couldn't be daddy's oldest girl anymore. And I had these two little brothers who got lost in the wash of it all. This stepmother earned me the nickname of Cinderella because my name's Cindy and I go to school and I've got this wicked stepmother and I've got all these chores and I fed all these animals and I'd go to school with hay in my pockets and they'd call me Cinderella. It took years later for somebody to remind me that Cinderella gets the prince. I didn't know that. All I could see was negativity because I was told as a very young girl that I was unloved, unwanted, unappreciated, unworthy. And I always would be. And there would be nothing I could ever do about that to change it. Nothing. That's just who I was. And I was told that every day, sometimes more than once a day. And as much as I believed that, because this was a woman of an authority in my life telling me this, as much as I believed that, there was this little girl in me that just wanted to be loved and accepted and appreciated and worthy. And so that little girl would do whatever it took to be loved and appreciated and worthy and accepted, even though knowing I wasn't going to be. And my birthday falls around Thanksgiving every year, and I didn't want to be a burden. So every year at Thanksgiving, I would say, just put a candle in the pumpkin pie. I love pumpkin pie, and that could be my birthday cake. The whole time wanting a birthday cake, but not wanting to be a burden, to want to be accepted. So every year I got pumpkin pie with a birthday cake in it. We're doing this potluck at work now for, I know it's other people's birthday in the office, but it's my birthday. And I'm like, this is what I want for my birthday potluck. And they said, oh, that's Thanksgiving dinner. I said, we will not call my birthday dinner Thanksgiving dinner. Do you hear me? This is my birthday lunch, and that's what it's going to be. There will be no pumpkin pie with a candle in it. And they're looking at me like, I'm like, I regressed, I understand. But this is what it's going to be. Because today, I'm no longer that little girl. Today, through the love of Christ, I can stand up and tell you what I want. And sometimes I get it. The thing I remember about my father the most was these words. I wish the three words were, I love you, but the three words, bring me a beer, it's four. But that's what my father said to me the most, bring me a beer, bring me a beer. And wanting to be loved and accepted by my father, I'd go get him a beer every time. That was my joy, to bring him a beer. One day, I heard my stepmother, the enabler, 
issue the ultimatum to my father, the alcoholic. And she told him, it's either them or me. Them being me and my brother. Well, my father being the alcoholic made the decision that alcoholics make. And my brother and I were on a plane back to Florida. So we get down to Florida and here's this new family. Now I've got an older sister that's going to protect me and love me and appreciate me. And I've got these three younger siblings. I call them the keepers. They're the ones my mom decided to keep. And I was like, wow, and I got this stepfather. I said, oh, it's a whole other family. It's going to be different, right? There was a little difference. The physical abuse in California was hidden. Like, you don't leave marks where somebody might see them. Well, when I moved to Florida, my mother take, cook, took great pride in leaving marks on your legs and then making you wear a skirt for school so everybody could see what had happened. You'd done something wrong. You were bad, and the world needed to know you were bad. A little difference there. There was all this hidey, hidey stuff in California. No, in Florida, it's all out. We're going to show people that we abuse you. We're proud of that fact. <clears throat> my sister was 16, and I was 13. And my sister was very promiscuous. And I didn't know the definition of that word or a lot of others at this time. And I was hanging out with her one night. I'm not sure why somebody thought that was a good idea. But I was hanging out with my sister, and... She's doing what she's doing over here in this bedroom of this house. And I get raped. At the time, I didn't know what had happened. I knew I was hurt physically and emotionally, and I didn't know what had happened. I was a very naive 13-year-old. And my, sisters gathered, my sister gathered me up, and she takes me home. And all I can remember was in the bathroom. And the evidence of the rape is on me. And my mother comes in, and like every loving, nurturing, caring mother would do, she said, oh, we lost our virginity at the same age. Right? Devastating. Devastating. It took years of therapy to get beyond that one. Some days I'm still not there. But my sister, who didn't protect me, did something else for me that helped me along my way. She introduced me to marijuana. And I got high. And I instantly, instantly, I was loved and accepted and worthy and appreciated. And I was funny and hungry. <laughs> and so started this whole cycle. Because now I have found out how to be loved and appreciated and wanted and worthy. And that's through sex. If I'm having sex with you, then you love me, and you want me, and you appreciate me. And if I'm getting high, I don't care. Right? And this started this whole long cycle. Let me back up just a wee bit, because this is a really, really, really important part. Back when I was in California, there was this little girl. Thank God for a praying grandmother and a church bus because we went to church on Sundays on this church bus. For whatever reason, they wanted us out of their hair and I was grateful to get out of their hair. And I remember sitting in that church that Sunday and that long, long aisle, you know? And the pastor gave the altar call. He's way up there and I'm way back here. And God just grabbed a hold of my heart and said, I got a gift for you, and it's my son, and I want you to accept that gift today. And I made that trek as a seven-year-old all the way up that aisle, all the way to that altar, tears streaming down my face. And I said, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. And instantly, he came into my heart, and I felt wonderful. I felt loved. I felt worthy. I felt the grace that only he can give. And I had that. And then I got on that church bus and I went back home and I was told I was unloved and I was unwanted and I was unworthy. I was unappreciated and I always would be and there was nothing I could do about it. And I forgot that Jesus conquered all that. 
And so I went back to believing that again and continuing to try to do whatever I could do so you would love and appreciate and accept me. So for years, used a lot of drugs, used a lot of different drugs, because if you ever use drugs, they quit working and you have to find new and improved ones. Then you have to find more of the new and improved ones. And you have to do things to get the new and improved ones. And you have to keep doing things to get the new and improved ones. And I did all that, every bit of it. And I remember very specifically, I'm in Gastonia one time, shoplifting, that's what addicts do sometimes, it's a fort of heaven. And these group of church people come up, you know, y'all recognize church people when they're coming up at you. And I saw them coming, and I couldn't get away from them. And they're trying to hand me tracks. And I said, not right now. And what I said was, God, go get in that corner. And if I need you, I'll let you know. I'm real grateful that he didn't. I'm real grateful that I don't serve a God that takes my orders. So years later, on this journey of addiction and destroying my life and my body and my spirit, I'm sitting in a crack house. It's got one window, one door. The dresser's pushed up against the door. The blankets are on the window, and I still think they're coming to get me. And I remember saying those words that God loves to hear me say, God, please help me. And he flung doors open. He provided help instantly. He showed me this little female police officer who I don't know what I look like, but I said, I need help and I need to go to detox. She asked no questions. She did no search. She put me in her car and took to driving. And about halfway to detox, she said, you got anything on you? I said, no, I'm not one of them. I used it all before I got in your car. <clears throat> so I got to detox and I was convinced that it was a certain substance I had an issue with. And they tried to tell me that I was the issue. And I didn't buy into that immediately. But I eventually did. And when I realized that there was something that could make my life complete and whole and worth living, I was like, oh, I'm so glad he's always been here, and I'm so glad he's never left me. Because had he listened to me, God wouldn't have been available when I hit my lowest point in my life. Had he listened to me, I would be living a miserable life. I would not be happy today. I wouldn't be loved and appreciated. I wouldn't be accepted, all those things. You know, I was listening to Heather, and you had an awesome dad. I'm really grateful that you did. And in life, you know, like you said, if you get one good parent, man, I had four sucky parents. <laughs> I had, you think, can I get a 25% chance of getting one good one, right? <laughs> no, I had four sucky parents. But let me tell you, there's gratitude in four sucky parents. Because out of four sucky parents, I learned everything not to do. Everything not to do. Now, when I became a mother, well, I got married at 16. That's crazy. I had my, my son at 18 and my daughter at 19. And I didn't know what to do, but I knew what not to do. And so often when my children were growing up, I didn't want to tell them, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I didn't want to tell them that. I heard that growing up. I heard, don't speak unless you're spoken to. Children are to be seen and not heard. I heard all this. I didn't want to drill that into my children. So I said, I'll do the opposite. I'll tell them what to do. You know? You want this, you go do that. You want this, you go do that. It wasn't about, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. I became a better parent because I had four sucky parents. I learned what not to do. I learned how not to destroy a child's spirit. I learned how to love and how to touch and how to hug and how to embrace and how to nurture. And I got to practice on these little people that God gave me. 
Now, you got to remember, I was using a lot while they were growing up. And these people have turned out to be pretty phenomenal adults. I take no credit for that, because God doesn't have grandchildren, right? Those are his babies. He just used me a little bit that I could. And they've grown up, and they make me so proud that I get to call them my children. But let me tell you about these other little people in my life. These are called grandchildren. Whew, right? This is an addict's dream. It's all the love, all the reward, none of the work. I just walk in the door, and they're happy to see me. Now, when mine were teenagers, they weren't happy to see me. Oh, mama's home. All right, right? These, these people, they're so happy just to see me. I get to go see them Saturday. I get to go spend my birthday with my babies because my daughter moved to Florida. Kim's working on that. We're going to get them back. But the thing is, is that by being a better parent to my children, as much as I didn't want my daughter to move to Florida and take my babies with her, there's a really proud mama that says, my baby's following her dream. She's going, not letting me manipulate her. She's going to do what she wants to do in her life. You know, There's a really proud part of me that's just a little bit bigger than the selfish mom in me that wants her to stay here. And I'm real grateful for that. 